Peter is not uh, with us. So the first talk that's supposed to be from Michael uh, Hare uh, with title Game Theory and Universal Curing Economy is canceled. So you are free to move to another room for this first quarter. And uh, we're going to resume at uh, 10 to 4, uh, 10 to 2 uh, in, in a quarter of a time. Sorry for this. And uh, if you want, you can stay here for the next talk in, uh, in 15 minutes.
Hi, let us uh, resume now uh, the session and uh, we move to the second uh, talk uh, of this session. Uh, all three talks, uh, they, they are going to be realized. The, the speakers are here. So I invite uh, Carlos Scudero uh, to talk about uh, rethinking uh, Ito versus uh, Stratonovic. So it will be 12 uh, minutes talk and uh, questions that you can always post on the chat. Yeah, Carlos, you may uh, share the screen and, uh, and uh, begin. Carlos, do you hear me? Mm, I don't know what is wrong. I guess everybody hears me. Uh, Dimitra, can you confirm that you hear me? Yeah, this is Hiroki. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So Carlos it seems to be here, but uh, for some reason, there is no, no development here from his side. So Carlos, if you hear me, can you please uh, uh, switch on your camera, your microphone and share the screen so that you may start? Ah, you cannot hear anything. Okay. Uh, then you have some technical problem yourself because it seems that people will hear me. So it's a local problem on your side. Uh, we cannot move on unless you do something, Carlos. Yes, thanks, uh, Lars. Can you hear me now? Uh, I, I can hear you now, yes. So that okay. means that everybody hears you now. So please go ahead because we're already two minutes uh, uh, back in time. Okay, I have the uh, pre-recorded. Okay, go on. Go on, thanks. Mm We don't hear anything. We only look, see the slides to let you know. Oops. Uh, so. uh, Carlos, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you can stop sharing your screen and uh, restart the screen sharing. And when you click the green button, there should be the checkbox, uh, you know, saying that the share the computer audio. Oh, okay, so let me, okay, so I'm not sharing the screen and, uh, and what click, should... Yeah, click the share screen button again. And then when you see the pop-up window, there should be a small checkbox. Right, uh, sharing the sound, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so. Good. Thanks, for giving Thanks, me Hiroki. to participate, to present my results in this conference. My talk is, a very, uh, is about a very classical problem, that of the determining the trajectories of the Brownian particle. This is the pollen particle observed by Robert Brown that was floating on a water surface and uh, developed a very rough uh, trajectory. In particular, I will focus on the, uh, on the model Langevin introduced at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the model, uh, which is basically Newton's second law. So we have here mass times acceleration. This is equal to viscous damping plus a white noise force that models the random impact of the, of the water molecules on the pollen particle. This model is not precise but we can make it precise by means of the introduction of a filtered probability space 
completed with the pinwheel sets in which a binary process is defined. And moreover, we assume that this binary process is adapted to the filtration. Now we can write the problem in this precise manner with a stochastic differential equation for the velocity, a random, a random differential equation for the initial condition, and assuming uh, the usual integrability, L2 integrability, and F0, F0 measurability of the initial conditions, we have the classical results for uniqueness as and global existence of solutions in this model. We can now take formally the limit m to zero to get the overdumped version of the model. This is again uh, formal, but we can make it precise. And this very simple problem can be solved to find that the trajectory is initial condition plus constant times the linear process. This is the simplest model for Brownian motion. However, we have difficulties, for instance, uh, there is no velocity, at least the velocity is not a, as a function valid uh, stochastic process. So if you want to compute the kinetic energy, we will find difficulties. So in order to show this, uh, let's try to compute the mean kinetic energy, which is constant times uh, velocity squared. Uh, we don't have velocity, so we use this different quotient, uh, difference quotient approximation for the velocity. We compute this expectation. So here we have uh, this expression, which is simply by substitution of the solution. Then we use the distribution of the Brownian, of the Wiener process to get this simple formula that diverges when the time lapse goes to zero. So this means that the mean kinetic energy of the Wiener model for Brownian motion is not well defined. Something different happens for the Langevin model. So the kinetic energy is one half times mass times velocity squared. We can solve for the velocity because this is nothing but the austin gutenberg process. So we find that the kinetic energy is constant times austin gutenberg process squared. And we can compute the kinetic energy. And this simple formula comes essentially from the application of the zero mean property and the isometry of the Ito integral. Moreover, when the time goes to infinity, we get this simple fraction. And uh, if instead of take, taking the time to infinity, we take the mass to zero, we get uh, exactly the same fraction. Uh, this agreement is shown as zeroable in physics because shows that the uh, long range properties of the Langevin model are uh, coincident with the, with the uh, low mass limit. And also, this low mass limit allow, allows us to define the kinetic energy of the, of the uh, binary model. Instead of doing this computation, we can do it in a different way. Uh, we need to assume a bit more integrality to, for the initial condition. Uh, and this other way is finding stochastic differential equations for uh, the process KT. One can use Cito calculus and find this stochastic differential equation. Alternatively, we can use Statonovich calculus and find this other stochastic differential equation. And actually, one would say, okay, you can use any of them and you will get to the same result. But if you look at the literature, for instance, this paper published in 2012, in the conclusion section, the authors say, it is evident that the stochasticians of all kinds, mathematicians, physicists, engineers, and others need constant reminders that the Ito versus Stratunovich problem was solved long ago. And they refer to a single reference, which is this uh, very classical Ito versus Stratunovich uh, paper published almost 40 years ago from now. And in the conclusion section, uh, we find, for instance, these two sentences. A physicist cannot go wrong by regarding the Ito interpretation as one of those, uh, those vagaries of the mathematical mind that are of no concern to him. Or from a physical uh, point of view, the Ito-Stotonovich controversy is smooth. This is, these are very uh, strong sentences which are meant to be general. But if you look carefully at this paper, there is only one concrete example. And the concrete example is the, this example I just showed you. So now, let me analyze it. For the equation, we have a unique solution, and this is a direct consequence of the Watanabe Yamada theorem. It's easy to prove that it is, in fact, the physical solution. This is a direct application of Ito's lemma. Uh, for the Satanovich equation, we have a different problem because it, it has infinitely many solutions. For instance, this one. Uh, uh, the moral under this solution is uh, we let the solution uh, be a normal physical solution. It fluctuates for a little while until time t1. T1 is the first passage time to zero. Once it gets to zero, then it, it stays in zero for some time lambda, and then we let it fluctuate, uh, fluctuate again. 
because lambda is arbitrary, you have infinitely many solutions. And we can complicate things more. For instance, if we define the family of, of stopping times Tm, we define it in this way where the tau n are, uh, is an arbitrary, uh, ar the tau n are arbitrary, uh, almost surely, lambda not Ftm measurable random variables. Okay, they, they are stopping times as well. So the way to think about the Tn's is the R, the successive passes times to zero. So the uh, second, third, fourth passage time to zeros, where of course this concept is not is not well defined, but I just said it's not well defined, but what is written here is well defined. And for the lambda n's, uh, they are uh, uh, arbitrary non-negative non, uh, non real numbers. And this is the these are the times the solution is locked down at zero. So for instance, we have this other family of solutions. We have the solution fluctuates, then at t1 it goes to zero, it, it stays locked down for a time lambda one, fluctuates uh, again, time t2 gets locked down at zero for some time lambda two, and so on and so forth. Because uh, we are discussing a physical problem, the observability of these unphysical properties of the solutions is important, in particular, we, we want to know if there is a well-defined time scale for the passage to zero. And we have this theorem that says that, in fact, the mean first passage time to zero uh, as a function of the initial kinetic energy is given by this formula. So we have an explicit formula. It's a bit ugly because it depends on these Dawson integrals. But anyway, uh, we have a direct consequence from this theorem and is the following one. If the initial kinetic energy of the Langevin particle is positive, then it becomes zero in finite mean time. This means, of course, that it becomes zero in finite time almost surely. So the physical properties of the Fourier solution, of the Fourier solutions, they have a well-defined time scale. And uh, moreover, we can make this time scale arbitrarily short by uh, tuning the initial condition. Not only the transient behavior is unphysical, but also the long time behavior can be unphysical too. At least this happens for this class of spurious solutions. So let, let uh, we have the following theorem. Let, let kt be spurious. By this, I mean is of the form of this long formula I just showed you a few slides before. And if we moreover assume that tau n are finite almost surely and the sequence lambda n is compactly supported, then we have this double convergence. On one hand, the kinetic energy goes to zero when time goes to, goes to infinity almost surely. And also its mean goes to zero as time goes to infinity. The second convergence is important in view of the equipartition theorem of classical statistical mechanics that imposes that the kinetic energy in the long time limit should be the Boltzmann constant times the absolute temperature divided by two. So this is a positive quantity. So uh, we find a contradiction. And this means that not only the transient, but also the long time behavior of the solution is unphysical. So in conclusion, we have analyzed a system, not just any system, but a system that has been used as the benchmark, as a benchmark for the comparison between Ito and, and Stratonovich. And for this system, the Stratonovich uh, interpretation presents infinitely many solutions with unphysical properties, and these solutions are not present in the Ito case, which admit, uh, admits a single solution, which is the physical one. So we agree with uh, these papers I just showed you and many other papers, you find uh, probably hundreds of them, which say that physical modeling, modeling is crucial in order to select the right interpre interpretation of noise. I fully agree with this, but actually the final selection, in my view, has to be done on a problem by problem basis because general statements usually find counterexamples. And this is not that much highlighted in the physical literature, in, in the physical literature, but just as crucial as physical facts are stochastic analytical facts. And in particular, the applicability of the Watanabe Yamada theorem for Ito SDEs and its non applicability for Stratonovich SDEs, uh, this, this is important in the interpretation of noise problem. If you want to see uh, these results, the proofs, and some extensions, you can take a look of this paper in the middle, which appeared in Studies in Applied Mathematics last month. Uh, some other preliminary results appeared last year in this uh, paper in Journal of Mathematical Physics, and there, there is a, a follow-up paper with more results, which is this one is still in review. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so 
Thank you, Carlos. And uh, we are open to questions, if there, if there is any question. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. I don't see any question in the chat either. Hmm. Okay, I, I don't have any question myself, Carlos, because that's not uh, within my field of interest. Uh, so, yes, unless the audience has a, que a question. If there is no question, maybe I can say one comment that it's... Uh, yes, go ahead. I, I don't know if this talk uh, really fits in game theory, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't select the section, so I just submitted the abstract, and somehow someone said that this was the section. Yeah, yeah. More physics oriented, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And anyway, uh, if there is no other question, so we thank Carlos for uh, for the talk and. Uh, thank you. Uh, Yes, it seems there are some comments here, but they are only congratulating comments. There is no question, as I see. And uh, from what I, I was informed right now, it seems that they also... Uh, so thank you, Carlos, for the, for the talk. So we move thank on. You. But uh, fortunately, it seems that the, the speaker of the next talk is not in the room. If Fernand, Dario Blanco Fernando is in the room, please uh, let us know. I am. Oh, you're here. OK. Yes. Okay, so uh, that's because your user uh, name is not uh, evident. Yes, you it's the Langofer. Yes. So please, it's the user from the uni. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. So Dimitri will give you the rights, and you can go ahead and share the screen and start the talk, so we don't have any delays. Thanks. Uh, I have a pre-recorded presentation, so please tell me if yes. you can oh, hear oh, it. Yeah. You are you are ready to go. You can share the screen and uh, start the video. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation in which I'm going to introduce the topic of our research. The title of this presentation is Complex Tax Solving in Groups of Autonomous and Collaborative Agents, Effects of Individual and Collective Adaptation. This I would like to start this presentation by asking you two questions that I would like you to keep in mind during the presentation. The first one is if you think that the political sort of reorganization of a group that is assigned to a project is positive or negative for how well this project is performed. And the second one is if you think that increasing individual learning is always positive for the, the performance of this project in a group. With these two questions in mind, I'm going to start introducing the motivation and objective of our research. Afterwards, I will present the model that we have set up in order to get to this objective and then some preliminary results of the model. Finally, I will finish the presentation with some conclusions we can draw from the results. Let's imagine a consulting firm that is tasked with a project. This firm is composed of various consultants, but each consultant is expert in one area. We have experts in accounting, experts in innovation, and experts in marketing. And the project requires of expertise in these three areas. But the individuals are experts only in one area. So what can we do to solve this? We can create a group in order to have the necessary expertise in all areas. These groups are dynamic. Why do we say they are dynamic? For two reasons. First, the individuals within the group change. They adapt by learning about the project and adapting their knowledge to the tasks they are facing. Then the group also changes. The group adapts to the requirements of the project, it self-organizes in order to meet the requirements of the project. What is the theoretical background behind this? Well, first of all, the project can be identified as a complex task. A complex task is a task that cons consists of multiple interrelated subtasks, such as our areas of expertise. The second aspect of a complex task is that the capabilities of an individual are not enough to solve them, as we saw. A consultant doesn't have the necessary expertise in all areas. Then, regarding adaptation, we have implemented the dynamic capabilities framework in our research. It states that group performance depends on the adaptation of the group to the project. It also states that adaptation occurs both at the individual and collective level. That are two aspects that we have uh, seen in our example. At the individual level by learning, the collective level by self-organizing. In the end, our objective is to understand 
how individual and collective adaptation affect task performance. Our contribution to research is that we are studying complex systems in the field of managerial science with human agents in order to provide relevant policy advice on the matter. To get to this objective, as I explained before, we have set up a model that is based on the NK framework for managerial decision making developed by Levinthal. We have a set of individual agents that are the consultants in our example that are utility maximizers. Their utility is, uh, consists of two parts, their contribution to the overall task performance and the contribution of the other agents to overall task performance. Then, the project as, we, as I explained before can be identified as a complex task that we have modeled as a task of consisting of 12 decisions that are binary. We divide this problem into three sub problems of sub tasks of four uh, decisions each. Each subtask is assigned to one of the areas of expertise. So the accounting team, uh, accounting people face a particular subtask, innovation, and the marketing, other particular subtasks. Then we have to we have to note that each individual decision of each subtask has an associated contribution to overall performance. This associated contribution is a function of two aspects: the decision itself and k other decisions. For example, take D1. Then C1, the contribution of decision one to overall performance, will be a function of D1 and K other decisions. For example, if K is three, let's see, it could be of two, three, and four, or of six, eight, and eleven, for example. In the end, the overall performance of the task is the average of the individual contributions of each decision to performance. Then we have modern individual adaptation. We said as a process of learning. With a fixed probability that is exogenous and determined by the modeler, agents can learn a new solution in the particular subtask they are assigned to, or they can forget a solution that is not utility maximizing at that, at that particular time period. We follow an approach of discovery learning in which agents learn autonomously without a teacher or a supervisor. Then we have Model collective adaptation as a, as a self organization process that occurs with a time span of tau. This process is a second price auction method in which agents bid their utility with imperfect information. They do know, not know the bids of the other agents. They bid their utilities based on their solutions they know to the partial sub, to the subtax they are facing and the top bidder of each area of expertise, accounting, innovation, marketing, is selected to form the group. Once the group is formed, they have to find a strategy to the overall task or, as, as say, a solution to the overall task at that particular time period. How do they do that? Well, the decision-making process within the group consists of agents making the decisions autonomously. They make decisions assigned to the particular area of expertise. Then communication is omitted between agents. So the agent assigned to the accounting department cannot communicate with the innovation expert or the marketing expert. In the end, the group strategy is formed by the concatenation of all decisions that the agents have taken. Our model consists of various variables. The, the main uh, exogenous variables are first, the time span that occurs between actions. Yes. Tau. And we have set up three values. Zero, in which the collective adaptation process only takes place in the first time period, and then an, an auction is never held again. Then, with tau equal to one, an auction is hold, held every period. We call the first uh, case zero collective adaptation, and this case high collective adaptation. Then, for t, uh, tau equal to 10, we have a moderate or a medium collective adaptation, and we um, have an auction every 10 periods. Complexity refers to the number of decisions that are interrelated with each other and are denoted by k. We are reporting um, results for k equal to 3. The number of decisions, as we saw, is 12. And then we have the probability of individual adaptation, p, 
which we have set from 0 to 0 0.5 in intervals of 0 0.1. Other parameters include the time steps of the model, t, which go from 1 to 200, which is all temporal horizon, and the number of simulation runs of each um, scenario, which are 1,500. The model starts by choosing the value of the variables and defining the agents, that is, assigning them to a particular area of expertise. Then the collective adaptation process takes place. The group is formed. And once the group is formed, the decision-making process, process takes place and the group strategy is selected. It reports a particular performance and then the agents of the group experience the result in utility. Finally, it, uh, this process ends when the individual adaptation process takes place and with a fixed probability, agents learn or forget solutions. As I said, the process repeats itself for t equal to 200 periods, and depending on the time spans we have selected between auctions, we'll go either back to the collective adaptation process again or to the decision making process. What are the preliminary results of our model? Well, we have, uh, first of all, we have to know that uh, our results are normalized at each simulation run by the maximum attainable performance. And then we have averaged our results across 1,500 simulation runs. We report and measure the total Manhattan distance to the maximum attainable performance. It is the sum of the differences between actual performance and the maximum attainable performance at each time period. We are interested in the end in the red area we have we can see in this uh, graph. And we have to note that this means that more total distance or so a higher number implies worse performance because the area is bigger and there is more distance to the maximum. We have plotted our results or distances in this uh, counter plot, in which in the y-axis we have set collective adaptation, so zero collective adaptation, only one auction, medium collective adaptation, auction every 10 periods, high collective adaptation, auction every period. And on the x-axis we have plotted the probability of individual adaptation from 0 to 0 0.5. The blue where the color is, as we can see in the legend, the better the performance is or the worse the total distance is. Results suggest first that for individual adaptation we can see a decreasing positive marginal effect of individual adaptation when there is no collective adaptation. This effect is always positive but decreases in magnitude as we increase the probability of individual adaptation. On the other hand, when we consider scenarios in which collective adaptation takes place, we find that this decreasing positive marginal effect eventually turns into a decrease effect in, decreasing effect in performance, and performance increase, decreases as we increase the probability of individual adaptation. Regarding collective adaptation, we find that in general, medium collective adaptation reports better performance. The only exceptions to this are for p equal to zero, in which individual adaptation doesn't exist, and for p equal to 0.5. What can we conclude from these results? Well, let's go back to the two questions we saw before about periodical reorganization and its effects on performance and increasing individual adaptation if it's, if it's always positive for performance. Regarding the first question, we find that a moderate, moderate collective adaptation is favored in complex environments that are of medium complexity. On the other hand, regarding the second question, we see that Indivi increasing individual learning is always positive if the group doesn't adapt, but can eventually lead to decreases in performance of the group if the group collectively adapts. Our results are quite interesting, but we have to know that there are future extensions to our research, such as imperfect forecasting agents and heterogeneity in the individual adaptation process and utility function. Due to time constraints, we haven't been able to include more results, but if you're interested, you can check our, our preprint at archive.org with more information. Thank you very much for your attention and please feel free to ask any question. Okay, uh, so thank you for, uh, uh, thank you for, for the talk, uh, Dario, Dario Blanco, uh, and we are open to questions if there are any questions. So you can use your microphone or you can just post it on the on the chat. 
Hi, I I just want I just wanted to ask if if um, if you take it into account. Well, you, you have this whole uh, organizational well corporate organization where where all these parts uh, come together, and I guess here is uh, assuming that the budget. Uh, is is not a problem, right? It's uh, the, the to the consultants and the and the accounting and everything that the money is is not really a problem. Yes, uh, we don't consider cost at this moment, but it's an aspect that I have discussed with my supervisors about possibly future, including issues of budget, cost of. Uh, individual education, etc. So right now we are not considering it, but can be a potential extension. All right. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. OK. Any other question, please? OK, since uh, this doesn't seem to be the case, I don't see anything in the chat either. So. Uh, Thank you again, and uh, we move on to the next speaker. Yep. And the next uh, speaker is uh, Samin Aref, who is here. Yes, uh, hi, Samin. So you can uh, start your talk. You can share the screen. You have rights for this. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, I have a talk on sign networks. So this is not uh, about. Uh, uh, game theory, but uh, yeah, it's about networks with positive and negative ties. Um, and I have a pre-recorded video that I'm going to broadcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. My name is Samin Aref. I'm from Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, and I'm going to present a joint work with leading Rezvan Rezapur and Yana Deisner on multi-level structural evaluation of sign-directed social networks. So this work is methodological in nature and it's about sign networks, but I hope that it is of some interest to everyone at this session. So as many of you know, sign networks are networks that have two types of edges, positive edges and negative edges. If we represent a sign network in a color, we use blue for positive and red for negative edges. And in black and white, we use dotted lines for negative and solid lines for positive edges. Another feature of our work is that we focus on sign networks in the social context. So these are networks where nodes represent some social entities, such as individuals. In the network on the top, the nodes uh, represent tribes. Um, another feature is directionality of the edges. So our focus is on developing a method for evaluating balance in sign networks um, where edges have directionalities. This means that we're dealing with um, uh, relationships um, which have both signs as positive and negative and directionality. For example, um, an edge may represent a friendship from person A to person B, or um, the enmity from person B to person C. You can also consider different contexts, for example, trust versus distrust or alliance and antagonism, as we can see in the network of tribes. So as many of you know, structural balance theory uh, suggests that if we have assigned networks, it is called structural balance if and only if the network can be partitioned into two groups, such that positive edges are uh, within the groups and negative edges are between the two groups. Here is an example sign graph. As you can see, we have positive and negative edges. The dotted lines are negative edges. And there are different ways that we can evaluate balance in this network. And our work is mainly about these different methods. So the most common method is look at the triads in the network. In here, we have one unbalanced triad, one balanced triad. And if you want to evaluate the micro level uh, balance in this network, uh, within the range of zero to one, we would get something like a half for the uh, triadic balance. Another approach is to obtain the optimal partitioning of the network into two groups, 
that is consistent with the assertions of balance theory. So when we do this, we get an optimal partitioning like this. And in here, we see that the only edge that is inconsistent with the assertions of balance theory is the edge 1,5. So we formalize this idea as line index of balance, as the minimum number of edges uh, which are inconsistent with balance theory. So this network is only one edge away from balance. And we can also normalize this value. So um, as the unit of analysis in our work, we use transitive semicycles. So as we want to develop a, a methodological framework for directed signed networks, we need to take the directionality of the edges into account. That's why we use semicycles as opposed to cycles. So semicycles are defined similar to a cycle, but the direction of the edges um, are disregarded. So uh, here in this figure on the left, you see a triad that has one semicycle. This means that um, you cannot follow the direction of these edges in a circular way, and that's why it's a semicycle. And in particular, we consider semicycles which satisfy the uh, property of transitivity. Uh, transitivity means that if there's an edge from A to B and edge from B to C, there must be an edge from A to C. And in here, in this figure, you see different triads which have transitive semicycles. So um, here is a real example, sign network of New Guinean tribes. Um, so each node is a tribe and the uh, positive and negative edges represent the relationships between these tribes. Um, as you can see, it looks like a hairball. But when, when we apply our methodological framework, uh, we get something like this. So this is the optimal partitioning of the tribes into two groups um, that is most fitting with the assertions of balance theory. According to this optimal partitioning at the micro level, we can evaluate the uh, fraction of transitive semicycles of length three, which are balanced. That's our uh, method of evaluating micro level balance. If we focus on the edges that are uh, between the two clusters, we get um, we can quantify divisiveness as a meso-level property related to balance. If we focus on the uh, edges inside the clusters, we get a sense of the cohesiveness as another meso-level evaluation of balance. And finally, if we focus on the whole network, we can evaluate balance at the macro level using the normalized line index of balance. So uh, you may check out our uh, open access paper for more information on the kind of networks we analyze. So we analyze networks in the context of Bitcoin traders, Wikipedia editors, and Reddit users. But more, interest more interestingly, we work on temporal signed directed social networks. So here is a temporal network uh, uh, from the Samson Monastery data. So in here, each node is an individual who was being trained to become a monk uh, at a monastery. And um, uh, over time, some in incidents happen uh, at this uh, monastery, uh, leading to the disintegration of this group. And when we evaluate this uh, network using our framework, we would see that actually over time, uh, our measures also show the increase in polarization across different layers, at the different levels of the network. Um, another, another type of network that we analyze is signed directed networks, which have multiple layers. So here is an example from Collins Philosophers Network. Um, in here, each node is a philosopher, and we have positive and negative directed ties between these philosophers, and there are two types of sign directed ties. There are ties between philosophers of the same status, which are acquaintance ties, and there are ties between philosophers who were uh, master and pupil. So uh, when we analyze each layer of this network uh, separately, uh, our evaluations show that the layers are rather perfectly balanced, so there are not that many sources of tension. But when we flatten the network and analyze all the edges together, uh, we actually see that the level of balance is much lower. This means that the sources of tension in this multi-layer sign directed network um, are across different layers of the network and are in motifs which have edges in different layers. So this is an interesting observation. Here are five takeaways from this presentation. First, we 
developed and demonstrated the application of an analysis framework for evaluating balance in directed sign networks. And we argued that directionality of the edges cannot be simply disregarded. The second takeaway is that balance could be evaluated at multiple levels. In particular, we discussed evaluating balance at the level of triads, subgroups, and the whole network, uh, to which we refer to as micro-level, meso-level, and macro-level balance. Based on our evaluation of a range of static signed directed social networks, we observed many phases of balance, by which I mean we observed different profiles of balance for these networks. There were uh, situations where a network could have high balance at the micro level based on its triads, but not necessarily having high cohesiveness at the meso level or not necessarily having high overall balance um, at the level of the network. The fourth takeaway message is from temporality. So we analyzed two networks which also had a temporal feature and uh, according to our analysis of the Samsung network, we saw that uh, the network could show a monotone increase in different values of balance over time. But this is not necessarily always the case because our evaluation of the uh, Newcom Fraternity Network shows that these evaluations, these values of balance could uh, oscillate over time without a specific increasing trend. So in this network, as you can see, uh, while uh, values of balance, especially the meso level uh, balance are uh, quite high, uh, over time, the, we don't see a monotone increase. And the last takeaway message is about multi-layer networks. So from our analysis of uh, philosophers network, uh, we observe that source of tension in a multi-layer sign directed social network could be particularly present across different uh, across layers of the network. And uh, this means that if we uh, analyze each layer separately, we wouldn't be able to detect these uh, sources of tension and this source of tension conflict were between philosophers who were uh, connected to one another uh, with uh, more than one type um, of relationships. So those who were connected by master-pupil relationship and acquaintance relationship. If you're interested in this work and would like to uh, build on top of it, you may check out our open access paper in scientific reports. You may check our publicly available data. Uh, the link is uh, in the supplementary information and the data is uh, on a fixture data repository. And you may check out our publicly available code on GitHub. Again, the link is in the supplementary information document. Here are some references. Here are also the links uh, for the open access article, the supplementary information, public data, and public code. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Samin. So we move to questions because there are questions here in the chat. And Sina, is al Sina Sayadi asks, uh, can you elaborate a little on the definition of balance on signed temporal networks? Of course. So um, first we need to think about static networks. So balance essentially means a specific configuration of the nodes and edges of the network. And uh, in static networks, we see that across different contexts, many sign networks are very close to balance. This is um, a rather interesting observation because uh, regardless of whether we're talking about a biological network or a social network or a financial network, we may see these patterns. And these patterns, um, uh, in a sense, um, are the idea of enemy of enemy being a friend or something like minus one times minus one being equal to one. And that's why it appears everywhere. And then in terms of temporal networks, uh, the idea is that um, uh, balance theory predicts that uh, networks may move towards uh, more balanced states or states which are closer to balance over time, meaning that balance is the um, 
is the absence of tension and, and conflict and networks strive to reduce conflict. And um, to, to test this prediction, um, uh, we can look at networks for which we have um, a range of uh, uh, um, time frames, and um, our results show that uh, there could be different situations. There, there, there was one network that had a monotone in uh, monotone um, development towards uh, more balance. And there was also one network which was oscillating around uh, a certain value of balance. So yeah, that's what, what I mean by balance in temporal networks. And then the second question from-, Sina, from are you satisfied with the question? Can we move on? Uh, because I think she has a- Oh, yes, so, so the follow-up from Sina, yeah. I read it out loud. Sina says, so just for clarification, you consider static snapshots of the temporal network. Um, yes. Um, if yes, any ideas on what can be done for sparse networks? So, uh, well, it, it's, it's not about the density or sparsity of the network. Um, our framework works for, for any network, regardless of whether it is fully complete, it's a fully complete graph or a, or a highly uh, sparse network. Uh, so if, if you check, check the article through this QR code, um, it, you, can, you can access um, access our algorithms for doing this sort of analysis. And they work uh, across different uh, types of networks, sizes and sparsity. Okay, so I think we move on to the next question. Uh, uh, Sina is satisfied, it seems to be. Uh, Kaveh uh, Katkoda asks, uh, what do you mean by evolution? And uh, is there any categories of, of events? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I, I must have used the, the term evolution rather loosely without a really uh, tangible meaning. What I meant was the, uh, the temporal dynamics. So the changes of the features of the network over time. That's, that's what I meant. That, uh, that, for example, for this like group of people who were being trained to become monks, um, at a certain point in time, person A was a friend of person B, but maybe one week later, they were not friends anymore. One week after that, they were enemies. So there were things dynamically changing, and these changes in the a micro features of the network, which are the, which are the relationships between individuals, could give rise to some uh, some macro level network property. For example, polarization at the at the macro level, or cohesiveness and divisiveness of groups uh, at the meso level. So that's what I meant by uh, evolution. I essentially meant uh, temporal dynamics. Okay. So, Kaba uh, seems to be satisfied with your answer too. <laughs> so, there doesn't seem to be any other question. And since we are a bit uh, over time, only two minutes. So, I, I suggest that we just thank uh, Samin and thanks also the other speakers. And uh, uh, by this, uh, I think we end the session here and uh, wish you a good attendance of the conference and participation as well. Okay, cheers. Thanks a lot, Dimitris, and thank you everyone for, for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.